we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Eric Barnes, I'm executive editor and CEO of the Daily Memphian, and thanks for, uh, for all of you for being here for, at our Women in Business uh, seminar. It's one of uh, four or five seminars we're doing this year. Um, the, the other three are up in the spring, small business, developing Memphis, commercial real estate. Um, this one is always my favorite, uh, going back to the old Daily News uh, before there was a Daily Memphian, so I think this must be the 10th or 12th year we've done um, uh, Women in Business, and it's always really great, and, um, and thanks for letting me host. Um, the, um, a couple things, Daily Memphian, we just we, uh, celebrated our fifth anniversary in the fall, which is pretty cool. We're very excited about that. Um, yep, yeah, thank you. If, um, I, I spent I just back in town after nine, ten days at various conferences around the country, and it is a huge compliment, not to us, but to the, it is a compliment to the staff of the Daily Memphian, but also to Memphis, that um, we are the, really one of the largest uh, local news startups in the country and to have made it five years and when I talk to people in the industry about what we've done they're just kind of amazed and like well how'd you do that and I said I don't know <laughs> I mean <laughs> some really really generous wonderful people who care a lot about the city came together and wanted to do this um, local news I'll do my quick spiel here and apologies if you heard me do it local news is in crisis right it's something like 35,000 jobs and local news have been lost in the last 15 20 years something almost 2,500 newspapers have closed across the country. They're closing at a rate of a couple hundred a year. And there's another 1,000 or 1,500 local newspapers that are sort of ghost papers. They, they maybe have one, if any, journalist, and they just kind of publish and put ads in there and run you know, regional copy and don't have any specific um, coverage of their community. And it shows. It shows in the data. It shows in the academic. People are disconnected from their community when they don't have a local paper. They don't have a, a voice they can trust. They are on Facebook groups or Instagram groups or Twitter or wherever they are getting. Um, you may not like some of the things we write, but we try to be accurate, right? Um, we do let people talk, express opinions. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's important. There's Pat. So it, it is a huge compliment to you all that um, I hope your subscribers, I hope your regular readers, um, if you're not, get on it and tell your friends and tell your family because it's, it's um, I, again, I've had this experience over the last uh, couple, week and a half of being reminded that what Memphis did with the Daily Memphian is very impressive. Um, to that end, we're also a nonprofit. So uh, if you're, a, which many people don't know, um, we're a nonprofit only because it's a terrible business for all the reasons I just said. Um, if you subscribe and you want to donate as well, we always certainly really do appreciate that. Um, we'll have our three speakers um, come up one by one here pretty soon. Then we get all three of them up here. We'll do a, a q and A. I'll have questions. We'll have questions from you all, um, and then we'll just kind of go until we get tired of each other, and there will be cocktails and some food. In there, I'm looking at Natalie here. I, out there, okay, out there. We're not doing. I was like, we're not doing outside today, are we? No, okay, all right. I just got off an airplane. That's the other thing. So I'm a little bit frazzled. Um, but first, uh, uh, we appreciate you all being here. We appreciate that you you buying a ticket. Um, but we also have uh, the sponsors who really make all our seminars possible. So we've got three uh, video messages we're going to play here, and then we're going to have some folks from Hutchinson come up and talk. So Memphis, the Bluff City, full of grit and grind home of the blues, and the birthplace of Paragon Bank. In 2005, a group of friends started Paragon Bank because we wanted to work for a locally owned, employee-focused bank that provided an extremely high level of customer service. Out-of-state banks typically don't know customers and only make decisions based on set criteria. We understand Memphis, we understand Memphis businesses, and we know our customers. We hire experienced bankers who provide a very high level of service to our customers. They create loyal relationships that then turns around and provides a great return to our shareholders. Everything we do at Paragon revolves around service. That's service to our employees, service to our customers, and service to our community. We like for our employees to get involved in organizations where they have a passion. We provide 40 hours of paid time for all of our employees to work in the community. And then the hope then is that they get very involved with that organization and make impacts on all of our community. Paragon's success is directly tied to the success of Memphis. That success can be measured by thriving small businesses, the dream of home ownership, and when everyday people can reach their financial goals. I'm Robert Shaw, and this is Paragon's story. Welcome to AutoZone. What are you working on today? My car is starting kind of slow. Let's see. 
Just needs to charge. It's free. Are you sure it's free? Positive. Welcome to AutoZone. What are you working on today? Picking up the Duralast brakes I ordered online this morning. Right now, you can save 15% when you buy a set of Duralast pads with rotors. We often ask our clients, what's the most powerful tool you have in realizing your financial possibilities and even dreams? Well, we feel it should be your financial partner. A lot of people may not understand what a true financial partner is though, so that's why we set out to create Alia to set ourselves apart from other firms by elevating the client experience and helping them live for the possible. As a certified financial planner, I take great pride in making sure that each client not only has a well thought out financial plan at the core of their wealth strategy, but also in considering other areas related to wealth, tax strategies, estate strategies, life insurance planning, and so much more. We want our clients living and enjoying their lives. And while allowing us to play a part in their financial life, they have the confidence to know that they can live how they want, retire when they want, and create a legacy for generations to come. That's the powerful difference of a partnership. That's what living for the possible is all about, and that's the Aaliyah way. Then uh, our last but not least, uh, Hutchison School. All of the sponsors have been with us in some form or another for many years, some going way, way back. Hutchison certainly is one of them. And we have a student, I believe, today, Carrington Davis, who's going to talk about Hutchison. So thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Carrington Davis, and I'm a junior at Hutchison, Hutchison School, a proud sponsor of today's seminar. I am excited to stand in front of such an inspiring group of business leaders. At Hutchison, I am a cohort member of its Institute for Responsible Citizenship. There I have learned the importance of building meaningful connections with peers and mentors, staying curious and open to new experiences, and taking intellectual risks. My classmates and I are honored to be here today to represent our school and hear the women on today's panel. Leaders who have boldly charted their own unique career paths while also making our community better and stronger. Thank you. Our, our first um, uh, guest speaker today is Carol Coletta. Carol is head of Memphis River Parks Partnership, which uh, if you have not been down to the new park that opened in the fall, officially opened in the fall, um, it is amazing, it is incredible. Um, and uh, our office until recently was right there and so almost every day I got to walk by or over or past it and it's really an amazing remaking. And Carol can t will talk or tell her story but um, is one of the most fun people to interview. I've interviewed you probably five, four, four or five times over the years on behind the headlines and in another context because Carol cares so much and knows so much about cities and how cities and people interact down to the street, down to the block, foot by foot. And so I look forward to hearing from Carol Coletta. Thanks, Eric. I'm going to echo Eric um, when he said, uh, you know, all these people over the last nine, 10 days have been asking him how he's done it with daily memphis, and he said, I have no idea. I kind of feel the same way when people ask me about my career. And they say, how did, how, how did you get where you are today? I don't know. So, uh, you know, if you had asked me to talk about the riverfront or cities or uh, downtown Memphis, I, that would have been easy. But talking about my career and reflecting on what I learned and certainly trying to give advice is really not in my repertoire. Um, so thinking about what I wanted to say, I, I have I, truly I have a lot of humility around this because uh, my career, like maybe some of yours, uh, it only makes sense in the rearview mirror. Uh, but I'm going to do my best uh, with a few short stories that seem pertinent to me, and I hope they will have some, uh, some lesson for you that, that seems relevant. So, chapter one. I developed an interest in cities really early. When I was in high school, I had the audacity to write our mayor and tell him what he should do with what was then a very empty, desolate Beale Street. I never imagined really that he would write back, but not only did he write back, 
he actually sent my letter to the head of the Memphis Housing Authority, which at the time uh, was managing um, the property. So my teenage ideas were treated seriously by people in charge, and that led me to believe that my ideas may be important and that someday maybe I could earn a seat at the civic table. Chapter two. I started college with a three-week-old daughter. Not the way you'd really like to start college, but there it was. I did find you could go to school in the morning and then, you know, and you could read a book and hold a baby all at the same time. So it kind of worked, but unconventionally it worked. But like a lot of young mothers, I was counted out. I would never live up to my potential. I would never make it. It didn't take long for me to develop a very stubborn reaction to being told what I couldn't do. Chapter three. My first real job was uh, in the sports information office at what was then Memphis State University or Memphis State. Okay. I, I was hired by the SID, the sports information director, um, to be a writing assistant. That makes sense, I was a journalism major. Did you know that? I was a journalism major. Uh, I was a journalism major, so I was qualified, I thought and he thought, but the athletic director, who, by the way, was recently inducted into the uh, university's Sports Hall of Fame, uh, decided, no, 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 she's a woman. She can't be a writing assistant. So my boss, who was pretty resourceful and actually kind of famous around town, he said, okay, you can't be a writing assistant, but you're a woman. You can be a receptionist slash secretary slash writing assistant. <laughs> I thought, well, oh, sure, that works for me. And the good news was he typed faster than I did. So <laughs> there was never a risk that I was actually going to be a secretary, which was good. I don't know. I, I'm old enough that when I was a kid, I got together with my little girlfriends and, uh, we would play careers. I, that, you know, I didn't even think about this till right now. We would play careers. And so when the, when the girls would get together, every, you, could, you could have one of five careers. You could be one of five things. You could be a secretary, a nurse, a stewardess, that was pretty cool, a librarian or a teacher, right? Does anybody remember this? You're not as old as I am, but this is why your progress has been slow. Okay, so you could be one of five things. <clears throat> and, uh, and I never, this is a true story, I never chose nurse, and I never, ever chose secretary. So to have that be my first job, in my first job title was really funny. Um, but, um, but my boss gave me really ambitious assignments, which in turn gave me great confidence about what I could do and what I could figure out how to do. Chapter four. In my next job, I was lucky enough to work for a legendary woman, Dottie Abbott. Dottie Abbott was one of the disc jockeys on the all-girl WHER station that Sam Phillips ran. And Dottie was like, she was the first and only division director at Holiday Inn's corporate. And I mean, she was a chain smoking, hard talking, you know, woman. But she was successful at Holiday Inn's. And what I learned from Dottie, she was amazing. She re reinvented herself as a corporate executive, but she figured out how to do that without changing who she was. Chapter five, while I was at Holiday Inns, I read about a group of volunteers working to revive Court Square and the, uh, in, down, in the heart of downtown Memphis, Court Square Park, and the alleys surrounding uh, that. So I, I read that, I was really intrigued. I'd always loved downtown, as evidenced by my letter to the mayor to tell him what to do about Beale Street. Um, and so I, I Track this woman down, track down the chair who happened to be a woman. And she happened to be another trailblazer. She was a stockbroker 
notice that was not one of the five careers I mentioned earlier. We didn't know women could be stockbrokers. And, uh, you know, I said, look, I'd really like to volunteer with your group. And she said, oh, we'd love to have you. I thought, well, what do you know? So uh, that taught me, you know, if you don't have the job you want, find a way into the job you want. Um, and, uh, and that began a really interesting uh, opportunity to work at City Hall and go on to be the first employee of what has now become the Downtown Memphis Commission and lots of other things. So now, here I am five decades later, uh, after starting several, three to be uh, specific, not uh, four profits in Memphis, uh, starting an early email newsletter. This is when email was new. It was an interesting time because you know what? When it was new, you could, if you were smart, you could, and this is how I started Smart City. I also did a public radio show that was syndicated, and you could get anyone to talk to you because you'd write them late at night, and the people who had email would respond to you immediately because they weren't getting a lot of email the way we do today. So that was, um, that was good. But that led me to do this syndicated public uh, radio show, which then led to, um, I interviewed Richard Daly, mayor of Chicago. And uh, it's a funny story. I interviewed him and he sent me this really nice note with a book. So I, uh, he said, are you coming to the CEOs for Cities meeting? I thought, well, I don't know anything about the city, CEOs for Cities meeting. But I wrote him back and I said, I'll be there if you invite me. Well, by that time, you know, the meeting was over. But his staff called me and said, are you going to be in Chicago anytime soon? And I said, you know what? I am planning a trip to Chicago. <laughs> sure, I'm going to be there, no problem. So I show up in Chicago, meet the mayor. And anyway, that led to crazy job, loved, one of my favorite jobs ever was being head of CEOs for cities in Chicago. So I moved to Chicago. Before that, I was working out of DC on the Mayor's Institute on City Design. And then I started traveling all over the US, then Europe and Australia, talking about cities and how to make them successful. Uh, started a new nonprofit, uh, inventing what was then a new field on uh, creative placemaking for 12 national foundations. That was the truly the craziest job working for 12 national foundations. Uh, then I went to Miami to run a $60 million portfolio uh, uh, with offices in eight cities um, and work, doing work in 24 cities for the Knight Foundation, which probably you were at the Knight Media Seminar. Um, and then, uh, then went to Detroit uh, to work as a senior fellow in the American Cities Practice at the Kresge Foundation, which then loaned me to the what was then the Riverfront Development Corp, now the Memphis Riverfront, uh, now the River Parks Partnership, to um, run a riverfront. Now, the last place I ever expected to end up at this point in my career is running a riverfront, but sort of demonstrated that you know you can go home again and you can love it. Um, so, you know, like you, I could recite a dozen different versions of this story, how I got here right now in this, in this place, in my career. But I, I think a number of factors have played a role. I'm stubborn. I don't give up easily. Good thing over the last eight years. Um, I had strong impetus, impetus to be serious early and uh, move fast because I had myself and my daughter to feed. I consider that a real gift. I've had people in my professional life and in my civic life who gave me opportunities I had no right um, to be given. Uh, I've had female role models who pushed career barriers, barriers aside, but they stayed true to themselves. And I've had a succession of experiences that plunged me into the unknown where I had to figure out how to make it work. And I've never been afraid to start things or start over. So the thread that runs through all this, and Eric said it, all the career twists and turns, 
uh, is my passion for cities and what makes them successful, particularly cities like Memphis. I have a real heart for um, underdogs. Uh, I wonder why that is. And, uh, and I love this city, and uh, I believe uh, there's nothing in the air, there's nothing in the water, there's nothing in the soil that makes us a city that somehow can't succeed. Not true. Uh, it's not our demographics, it's, it's, it's us. We can decide, and the people in this room, I look around, I know some of you, you know, we are in positions to make sure Memphis succeeds. And I hope you will all uh, do that. This career, which I think started developing when I was age 12, riding the 13 Lauderdale uh, bus downtown from Longview Heights in South Memphis, uh, turned it into a career that for me uh, is very happy and very satisfying. Um, even now though, 50 years in, um, you know, when you kind of start to believe, hey, I think I know something, I think I know what I'm doing, there's still so much more to learn, and we're trying to learn every single day on the riverfront. Every day I ask my team what's working, why do they think it's working, give me the evidence, uh, what's not working, what, what can we do better? I mean, there's, I get up every morning curious and feeling urgent to find out what's working and, uh, and do it do the job well enough that cities around the country and even around the world will look to Memphis uh, as their model. We don't, you know, I, I try to, I think best practices, that's looking in the rear view mirror, best practices, uh, the, the field, if you're looking at best practices, the field has moved on. I would say, you know, we all need to be future leaning and uh, that's not about studying what someone did 10 years ago. Um, so I feel like I'm on a learning journey, but <laughs> also after 50 uh, productive years, uh, when you think you know something, there are still some very unpleasant surprises. Uh, I had a recent one-on-one -on -one conversation about an issue critical to our work. Uh, a colleague outside our organization prefaced his comment to me with this. I'm going to explain this to you like a parent would to a child. And I thought, yeah, right, exactly. And I thought, oh my God, I'm, wait, wait, wait. 50 years on, I still have to, you know, wait, receptionist, secretary, writing assistant, I don't know. Um, so, you know, sometimes you have to wonder, what have you really accomplished? Will you ever accomplish enough to convince you and others that you really have something to offer? Um, okay, so I want to wrap up with this. How many of you saw the Grammys recently? three weeks ago, two weeks ago, okay. So I don't know if you heard um, Tracy Chapman and Luke Combs. Uh, I, I loved it, and uh, when they sang Fast Car together, and I was thinking, Fast Car was released 40 years ago, I think, and, um, but I, I was listening to it over the next couple of weeks, and I would kind of cry every time they sang it. I thought, what is getting to me about this song? And, um, it's the refrain, you know, I, I had a feeling that I belonged. I, I had a feeling I could be someone, be someone. And I think each of us in this room is privileged um, to be here and we should ask ourselves every day, who can we make feel like she belongs and that she can be someone? Uh, a lot of people did that for me and I hope I've passed that along and um, I hope you will too, thanks. That was awesome, um, that was amazing, um, thank you. Um, next to that, we're going a little out of order from the, what I think is on the agenda. Uh, Pat Mitchell Worley is CEO of the Soulsville Foundation which operates Stacks Museum of American Souls, Stacks Music Academy, Soulsville Charter School, all at the original site of Stax Records in the Memphis community of Soulsville. She's been involved in all kinds of other things, including Beale Street Caravan. And I knew you, but then we have been board members of WYXR, a partnership of the university, Crosstown, and the Daily Memphian, and have had immense fun and learned a whole lot uh, being on the board of WYXR with Pat Mitchell Worley.
Okay, so I always try to lead with the kids, okay, because they, so, I can talk to you guys, I can tell you all of these things that I get to do every day, but when you see our kids, when you see the kids at Stax Music Academy and the Soulsville Charter School and you get to experience them every day, there are some good days, there are some bad days, okay, because they're teenagers, but in that process, it makes you feel like I've got things to do because I'm doing it for them. And I think that that has um, impacted my career. Uh, even in being a, I, there are so many things that Carol said that I was like, oh my goodness, I say that. Oh my goodness, yeah, that happened to me. Oh my goodness. Um, and to go after her as I followed her career and everything that she has done. And um, it's, it's it's very it's very humbling to come after you. So thank you, thank you for everything that you have done for all the lady bosses. You know the ones that are lady bosses now and the ones that are coming because there are a lot of battles that we have to we have to deal with. As you mentioned, um, the comments that are made, the microaggressions that we deal with. But I'm just going to try to tell you a little bit of my story and how I got here. Uh, first of all, my I think back to being in, um, in my mid-20s and me and my peers are sitting around and everybody is somehow in, in music one way or another. And we were like, what, what's the dream job? What's your dream job? Where would you want to work? And I remember distinctly saying the Soulsville Foundation. That's the top of the ladder for me. That's my dream job but it'll probably never happen because communications director Tim Sampson will never retire. <laughs> Tim Sampson still works at the Soulsville Foundation. I would just want y'all to know that he is not retired 20-something um, years later. And it's, it's always sort of amazing for me because I think back to, I never thought of myself as, you know, running the organization. The role that I thought I was going to be in was communications director. That was the top for me at, you know, 25. And to be here today just sort of blows my mind away every time I go to work. Now, my first real job, and I mean real job that was like, this is something I'm thinking about career and everything, it was working at Memphis in May. And I worked on, under this combined boss lady energy that was Deanie Parker and Cynthia Hamm. And the two of them were <laughs> hard. <laughs> Some very tough conversations happened. Um, very tough conversations. You know you don't know how to do that even though you think you do. Um, that was a, a favorite that came up very often. Um, because I went into everything, you know, I was like the bull in China shop, I'm gonna get it done, I'm ready, I'm gonna give 150%, whatever I have to do. That was my attitude and everything. And they sort of helped me shape that into something that was a little more manageable, not so scary, um, because I can be very scary sometimes with the energy that I am always high maintenance, I wake up in the morning, I'm ready to go, I'm a morning person, and that's just what you get all day. 
And uh, being able to control that has been a big lesson in my life. But I loved going to work every day. It was just like a joy. And at that moment, Memphis in May was at the center of so many movements, whether it be the downtown revitalization, all of the discussions on economic development for the city, the arts and culture education piece that was happening. And that's just to name a few things. So when they asked me, I started that job seasonal. I was supposed to be there for five months. At the end of five months, they said, will you stay? I was like, oh, well, I had plans. Um, I was, I was leaving Memphis. I was not going to stay here. I was going to be in the music industry, in the music industry. That means the infrastructure that is the industry because I do not sing. I do not play. I help those that do. Okay. That's all I can do. That's all I've got. And so I knew that if I wanted to do all that, I didn't think that Memphis was a place that that could happen. But I loved working at Memphis in May. And I said, well, you know, yeah, I'll stay. And I still, that was my day job that afforded for me to write for music magazines and work with independent artists doing PR. And as I went to all these other cities and I got to see what their scenes were like, Memphis always came up. And I realized maybe I need to know a little bit more about Memphis music. My parents told me about it. My grandmother forced me to listen to jazz and blues and I fought the whole way. You know, no, 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 that's your music, that's your music. And I realized that everywhere I went, when it came to music, Memphis was the city that they were talking about and they knew more than I did. So I had to do a little bit of educating myself. And that took me on an amazing journey. And Memphis in May really made me fall in love with Memphis in a way that I had not seen as a young person. It was welcoming. Memphis was moving forward. Memphis was um, culturally diverse, that we could find it all here. And that one organization did that for me. And I think that that was the first time that I saw a future for myself here. Now, I want to highlight that because today when I talk to my daughter, who's a freshman in college, her friends, um, our students on the Soulsville campus, a lot of them say that they can't wait to get out of Memphis. They can't wait to leave here because they don't see a future for themselves in our city. Our best and brightest are questioning, what does Memphis have for me? And I think that's our fault. I think it's our responsibility to help them see that. When we ask kids, why do you say that? They say, because we don't have a space of our own. We don't have places to go to. We start going somewhere and then they create some rule that says only two students allowed. You can't be here without your parent. Now there are some deeper conversations that go with that, those, that policy making. However, young people feeling like their city is their city is an important piece because that's our future. So happy to see all of you Hutchison girls here. Come back to Memphis after you go to college, okay? Um, but I do think that it's our job to work to attract the next generation to our city. Now I'm gonna go back to, to how I got here today. I had a career plan. I'm a bit of a planner slash control freak. So I plan everything out, I write it out, you know, this is what I'm gonna do. And so I decided that I was gonna be a radio personality, a TV personality, a PR maven, and that I was going to be a music writer. And I figured when I timeline that out, it should take me my entire life to get all of those things done. <laughs> so at 30, when I'd accomplished all of those things, I had a bit of a breakdown because what in the world am I gonna do now? I've spent you know, years into this plan and I'm already here. And it made me, it really was a crisis. <laughs> I didn't know what to do and I had to look at things differently. What I learned along the way was about reinventing myself. And let me introduce y'all to teenage me. My sister's in the back so she can tell y'all this is really how it was. I listened to a lot of heavy metal in my room and I was in theater and my wardrobe was varying shades of black and uh, I never wore any makeup. And the dreams that I had, that attitude might not get me there. So I realized that I had to learn some new things. I had to meet some new people. 
maybe I should expand my color palette beyond black, you know? All of those things um, came to mind. And when I say reinvent yourself, I don't mean be something that you're not. It's just that we are very complicated, wonderful organisms and our best selves, you know, there are so many versions of that, of who we can be and who we want to be that day that if we just take some time to explore it, I just think that there's a place for all of that within one person. Because if you just listen to my music playlist, you would know the same person listens to all of this. Yes, because that's who we are. Now, I didn't learn any of these things on my, on my own, honestly. I'm a generally nosy person, have been since I was a child. I love to ask questions. Immediately when I got in the car, my mother said I always went, where are we going? Why are we going there? Where are we going now? Why are we going there? And um, they learned that if they put me in the car, they like to go distances, so I would just fall asleep. <laughs> that was the hope, that I would just stop talking. But I know that, that my dad always said to us, and he denies it now, but he always told us to learn what the rules are. Then you can figure out which ones you can break. Some rules you cannot break. You know, I can take a piece of paper and drop it right now, it's gonna fall to the ground because it's gravity. In this space, I cannot break that rule. Maybe if I were in a no pressure room at NASA, I could. But learning the rules and then figuring out where are the places you can break them so you can change things if you wanna see something different. Uh, over the years, the universe had a lot of pity on me and I had a lot of really great mentors. Uh, I have never walked away from hearing a different perspective because I know that sometimes I don't even understand or you know I can't comprehend what someone's saying and it's that time that somebody gives me something completely different that I say, oh, well I never thought about that. That's really how you see it? And it's helped me in every space that I've been in. It's been a determining factor in my career. I would say just because of being open to hearing new ideas and to hearing just different ways of thinking. So after that fall apart at 30, I realized that I needed a new career plan. And the things that I knew is that I loved music and I will champion it as an economic development machine, I will, as for its psychological benefits, for its um, culture benefits, and species evolving benefits. I'll do that until my last breath. But I also fell in love with the nonprofit sector and its goal to meet community need. And that, I think, I put the two together. I made a promise to myself that I would always take jobs. The, the two things that I would ask myself is, do I believe in what I'm doing that I enjoy going to work every day? And two, am I gonna learn something? If I'm gonna be challenged, then I can make myself get up every day because it's fun, it's exciting. Being curious is an exciting thing because you never know what's gonna happen next. And the universe gives you a lot of surprises along the way. I think that that took me to the places that were pivotal moments in my career, whether it was working at Impact Memphis and that goal to get young professionals together before they became the CEOs so they could start working on making the city better, or it was working at the Memphis Music Foundation and helping make music an economic engine for the city. All of those were a part of me answering that call to myself of, do I enjoy going? Am I gonna learn something? And I even found that doing consulting work, I got to work with all the arts organizations that I love and the same thing happened. Whether it was Ballet Memphis, Hattie Lou, Memphis Children's Theater Festival, every bit of it I loved. And I think that I worked at Stax, I was part-time, I taught a music business class, it was fun. But some of my clients said, wow, you sure are there a lot. And I was like, yeah, they really don't pay me for being here, but I find myself, I keep going. <laughs> the kids keep, they're just so great. I keep finding myself here. So I went from being the part-time employee running a program, teaching a class, 
and the uh, executive director, production director, both announced that they were leaving. And the CEO of the Soulsville Foundation asked a few people, and he was like, oh my goodness, I need somebody with my nonprofit experience. And numerous people pointed him my way. I didn't plan on taking that job. In fact, I was on my way on vacation with my daughter. We were going on a month-long vacation. And I said yes, because I knew that everything that I stood for, everything that I believe about Memphis, about what music can do, how music can change lives, and how it's more than just an anecdotal story, there are real facts and figures behind what music can do, that's what Stacks represented for me. And I took the job a few months later um, because I had, I, I, like I said, I go, I go at it 100 and 150%, um, sometimes more. They said, okay, will you stay? I said, oh, okay, yeah, I'll stay. I didn't plan that either. Um, and sometime after that, our CEO, he decided he was gonna leave and he said, will you? be interested in the job? I said, no, that's not me. That's not me at all. I'm not CEO. That's not what I, I don't see myself when he goes, really? And then I thought about it and I said, well, gosh, if it's not me, then who is it? I believe in this place. I believe in what we do. I believe that the message that we talk about, Sax Records and all those things that are the tenets of the Sax story, whether they be diversity, economic empowerment, creativity, women owning businesses, what? Minority business ownership, entrepreneurs, all of those things are still a part of our conversations on how can we improve them. So why not use the Stack story to get people to have these conversations? That's what we do. I have the joy of helping students, being a part of students at the charter school, figuring out what they're gonna do for the rest of their lives and finding peace, joy, in financial freedom, in community involvement, and really in personal growth. I get to do that every day. And then I get the honor of helping little creatives, little me's, every day figure out how to grow their craft, how to be themselves, because I was a weird arts kid, and I'm fine with that. I'm weird arts adult now, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. And it's so wonderful when you accept being weird, and you accept being different, and you know that, hey, we're all different in some way, so it's not really that strange. I get to do that every day. So I wish that, you know, I could give this, um, this through line of how I got to this place, as Carol said, it's not, you know, when you look back over it, it makes sense. It was really, for me, just about acquiring skills, learning new things, working with great people, and being passionate about the places that I worked at and the missions that they have. It's worked for me, and I think that when I stopped worrying about the title the corporation, the company, whatever that I was working at, and I just stuck with those basic, what I call human needs. Even though it's career, it's still human needs. And I thought about that. That's when I truly became happy in the work that I do. So I give a cheers to 20-year-old me, 25-year-old me, who thought that she could be the communications director, maybe if some guy retired, and now is the CEO. So thank you guys. <laughs> Uh, last but not least, uh, Chloe Joy Sexton is owner of Bluff Cakes. She's a former news producer and marketing whiz turned baker and published author. Uh, her passion began uh, for, for baking began with her love for everything Martha Stewart. And I will tell you later, I was just in Martha Stewart's original test kitchen in New York. It's a super boring story, but I saw this Martha Stewart thing. So I will not bore you. I will bore her with it over a drink. Well, that's how we'll do it. But it was kind of cool to be there. Um, and uh, I, I had all these stories I could say about Carol and Pat and having worked together. I met Chloe 20 minutes ago and she seems awesome. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and bring her up. I had 
glad to be the one to bring a presentation. <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, thank you to both of you for your stories today. Honestly, it's intimidating to come after both of you, so buckle up. Um, <laughs> I will do my best, but really they resonated with me in so many ways, and it's an honor to be here with both of you. Um, hi, if you've never heard of me before, I'm Chloe Sexton. I'm the owner of Bluff Cakes. We now have a bakery in Germantown, not far from Trader Joe's, which I know all of you go to. Um, just by a show of hands, because honestly, what I'm better known for is not for that bakery, but for our footprint online, um, mostly to TikTok. I know, hear me out, hear me out. Um, but just by a show of hands, has anybody ever seen any of those videos or been to our bakery before? Okay, all right, for the rest of you, again, buckle up. So, <laughs> um, I know what you're thinking. What does this have to do at all with baking, owning a bakery? Well, honestly, that was never my plan. Um, I started out my life with a real, real passion for storytelling and for activism, mostly thanks to my mother. She was um, president of her national organization of women's chapter in Gainesville, Florida, um, which is a very activism-based city. So believe me when I say I'm very happy to be in Memphis, to have ended up here, luckily. Um, I was positive that I was going to be the next Anderson Cooper. That was my journey, I knew it. I, throughout high school and then college and then eventually ending up in news, I did radio and I just knew this was going to be the thing that completed me and it made sense for me because I was good at being on camera, I would love it. Um, imagine my surprise when I accomplished all of that and it just wasn't it for me. So I, I had this missing piece and mind you, in my early 20s, I was working what they call kind of like that, that dead of night shift, that night crawler shift, midnight to 8 a.m. I'm 22, alone, in downtown Memphis, like opening Channel 3 doors and locking myself inside of them and hitting the hardest news hours completely alone. Obviously, that takes a massive toll on your mental health and also if your capabilities of going, am I capable of telling the story appropriately? I'm just a girl. <laughs> I'm literally just a girl. They gave me the keys to this building. Why did they do this? So very intimidating. Um, but I can honestly say that beginning my career, no matter where I ended up with news, built me into who I am today. So let's take it back a little bit and explain how I did end up in baking. So after my mother's years in Gainesville, Florida, you know, single mom, just me, just her, she rapidly uprooted us at the age of 10 and moved us to middle of nowhere, Tennessee. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with McNary County, but at my time, you know, early 2000s, that was population 6,000, and I needed a hobby. I desperately needed a hobby. I was a very busy child, but um, I needed a hobby that was affordable and accessible in the middle of nowhere. And I also, I did, I loved Martha Stewart. I watched so much Martha Stewart with my mother and I thought, I can do that easily, I can do that. It's incredibly challenging, okay? It's, it's incredibly challenging to make a French macaron. It's incredibly challenging to make a good ganache that doesn't break. Um, I learned that, but it's a hobby that kind of stuck with me over the years, and I always treated it as such. It's a hobby, right? Because I'm going to be a serious journalist. I want to be taken seriously. I want to be a professional. You can't be that and make cupcakes. And I was so sure of that, so I kept those things separate. I, I always told myself, that's a cute little hobby, but you want to be taken seriously. Don't make cookies. So um, eventually, you know, if there's one thing about news people, they are incredibly honest, and I use that to my advantage. So in those daylight hours when all of my other much more fun young 20-year-old friends were going out, spending late nights, I was, of course, in the news station. So with my daylight hours when I wasn't sleeping in like four-hour shifts, I was baking. And what I would bake, I would bring to a news station. And they would either spit it out or tell me, try again, or tell me, you actually did it this time. It's decent. And... I fueled that, I loved that because I love a challenge. Um, eventually, uh, because I had so much downtime on my hands and I honestly started to feel a little bit more confident in that baking, I created what I consider just a silly little Instagram for it, um, which actually started catching speed in my city. And then my anchors that I was giving all this free baked goods to started asking me to make things for them and more and more, I actually started gaining custom orders, which was bizarre to me. Um, and I still told myself, that's not it for me. I want to be taken seriously. I want a career. 
Um, it was actually on our, I didn't mean to slip this in, but I'm going to now. Um, the year that my husband and I got married, 2019, he presented me with a wedding present. It was a box and it was filled with business cards and a password to a website and a logo, the one that we still use to this day. And he said, I don't think you understand how seriously I take you. You keep saying it's just a silly little hobby, but I've never seen anything make you as happy as that does. You spend all of your time at that real job thinking about this. I want you to take yourself seriously, and I think you have a future in this, so I want you to act like it. And I was like, <laughs> I cried. Obviously, I cried. <laughs> I cried. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, <laughs> so, obviously, let's, let's fast forward to the year. I don't think any of us will ever forget the pandemic. Um, I actually did end up leaving news. That was a heartbreaking but very necessary breakup that I did. Um, I just wasn't in it anymore, and I was trying to figure out what the hell my dream was going to be if it wasn't going to be that. I was supposed to be the next Anderson Cooper. So I moved into the next thing that made sense to me, which was marketing. I worked with a wonderful firm here in Memphis that represented not only some of the largest companies and organizations in Memphis, but some nationally as well. And I rapidly gained skills in marketing that I was able to turn over and start using on that silly little Instagram. And I did, I did listen to my husband. I started taking it seriously. When the pandemic hit, I'm sure all of you remember seeing empty shelves like that. The bread was gone, the toilet paper was gone. I couldn't do anything about the toilet paper, but I could do something about the bread. So as quickly as possible, we put together a free delivery, contactless delivery uh, menu where people could order a variety of things, obviously their necessities, but also try out some of my other products. And I did not anticipate how much they would take advantage of that. And quickly, we were not only able to uh, subsidize our income with lost jobs and the shifting needs of the pandemic, but we were making a footprint in this city. I was gaining so many followers of real people who lived here and really wanted more of our baked goods, not just because they were out of bread, but because they really liked what I had to offer. And I was able to gain a confidence that I didn't have before. Um, Oh, that mixer right there, that was a crying happy day for me. I don't think you know how much a mixer that weighs 200 pounds on your counter will change your life and make so much more possible, but I cried when he bought that for me. So, <laughs> big heaving sobs, best day of my life. So, um, yeah, at this time, again, I'm working in marketing and I really started to plan out a future where what if one day I leave a desk and I just bake, and maybe that might be possible for me. It was at this time, not only that I was gaining following here in Memphis, but I had dipped my toe into the world that is now TikTok. It's a touchy subject. I was in the early days of it, and I was rapidly growing a following that I didn't anticipate to grow. Um, I used all said platforms when Black Lives Matter, the real moment that we remember shortly after the pandemic, not only came to our city, but it came to our nation. And if there was one thing I knew about myself, it's that I didn't just want to be a business and I didn't just want to be a person. And that is something that the world of professionalism and marketing will tell you, you pick one. And I didn't. I chose not to pick one. Unfortunately, that was my first real moment in understanding just how viciously the internet can turn its back on you, harass you, threaten you, threaten your family, find where you live, dox you online if you don't understand that. Um, and what it might cost to not choose to just be a business, but to also be a person and let your voice be heard and to use the platform that you're growing for good. Um, I'll be honest, I wavered on it after that experience, but I saw so much more good come out of using my voice for what I really believed in. And not only that, but supporting a city that has deep, deep roots in activism. And I wasn't gonna turn my back on that. I saw an opportunity to just let my voice be known and I continued to do it. Um, yes, it was terrifying. November of 2020, the scariest day of my life. It was the week before Thanksgiving. I was maybe two, three months into gaining a marketing director position for a national nonprofit, one of the proudest moments of my life. And I made that tricky little mistake of telling that employer that I was pregnant. And two days later, I was fired with absolutely no reason and with a list of 
glowing, glowing words from my previous uh, direct manager and CEO, and there was just no sense of it. There was absolutely no sense of it. I'd done nothing but had a good job, and it actually took me an embarrassingly long amount of time, a good three to four hours to put together, you just told them you were pregnant. You're not bad at this job. In fact, you've been told a thousand times, you're great at this job, you're a natural, but you're pregnant, and you're a woman and therefore you're a liability. And no surprise, I was immediately replaced with a man who was far less qualified than me. Um, my husband and I, again, still catching our bearings after the pandemic, had just bought a house, just bought a house. I also have a, who's now a nine-year-old bonus son, so I'm pregnant, I'm jobless, I'm terrified. I stared at walls for a few hours, and then I did the only thing I know how to do, which was immediately get to work. I had previously put out menus and information about like, I'm putting a cap on what I can do for the holidays as far as your pies and your cakes. I removed that cap. I began working not only through the night, but at least 12 to 14 hour days. Did I stress pregnant? Pregnant. It was incredibly difficult, but there was nothing else to be done. More importantly, I was continuing to gain a very large online following. At that time, I had around more than 300,000 TikTok followers, people who were invested in my baking and also my personality, but there was no way to reach them. No way to reach them. I can't mail you a cupcake. I have no experience in doing something like that, but they were so invested every day in these daily videos of my baking and my passion for it and just who I was. It was an untapped customer market and I had no idea how to reach them, but I knew that I needed to reach them fast. Um, so we began doing bluff cakes. If you visited our website today, you would see, you would almost think the only thing we'd ever done is ship giant cookies. That was not the original idea. I was just a girl. I was just a baker with a silly little hobby. But I knew, again, that I was jobless, and I had a house to pay for and a family to support. And I started thinking, what can I do? My collective skills in marketing, in, in what I learned about how to tell your story in journalism. And we started developing the giant cookies. It was an item that I knew could be shippable. I knew it was sustainable. I knew it could be profitable. And maybe, also, I just thought it was a good, fun idea. But I wanted it to be something and successful and fast, really fast, please. You only get nine months. So thanks to not only uh, the fast development of these recipes and an even faster growing audience and my husband's help sourcing in a matter of 10 days every product that we needed, all of the food safe packaging, you'd put the cookie in, the boxes, making them affordable, the rates, no matter where we're gonna ship them because we're opening up to all 50 states immediately. In a matter of 10 days, we made that possible. There was not a lot of sleeping going on, obviously. We prepared hundreds and hundreds of sealed giant cookies, placed a menu online, and New Year's Eve of 2021, we launched, no, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day of 2021, forgive me, we launched it, and then we prayed, because that's really all you can do. There's no telling if that's gonna be a success, and as many times as people online say they wanna support you, they wanna try your product, they wanna ship it, are they actually gonna do it? Those hundreds of cookies sold out in 24 hours. When I restocked them four days later, they sold out in 12. And for the following year, no matter how big we raised those numbers, thousands of giant cookies, it became a viral race online to buy them as quickly as possible. And we could not keep cookies, thousands of cookies in stock for more than eight minutes. Obviously, that was an incredibly important role for me. Um, and it took a few months of that actually keeping up to feel like, I think I actually did it. <laughs> because it doesn't matter when, you, when you're somebody who's as scared as I was, but also as competitive as I am. It takes a while to actually sink in that maybe you did it. Maybe you actually did it, and you need to stop waiting for other people to tell you you're a success and it's gonna work or you should try it, to just do it. And I'm glad that I did. <laughs> um, at this time, like I said, I had chosen to keep my audience online, seeing me not only as a business, but as a person. I was sharing videos every single day of how I was doing this, how I was hauling hundreds and hundreds of pounds of cookie dough out of what was then a commercial rented kitchen, 
um, and doing that all six months pregnant. It's a feat, I'll tell you what. And the videos and the views showed for themselves that people just couldn't believe. How do you do it? The answer is you have to. Keeping that door open with my audience meant they weren't just they weren't just customers. They were people who were not just really invested in giant cookies, but my story personally. They cared about who I was as a person, and I wanted to keep honoring that. So in 2022, when my mother began her third battle with brain cancer, I opened my door about that too. My content became more than just, I'm selling you a product, here's my personal story, I'm so pregnant, but more so, these are the things that every woman who owns a business is going to be facing. You have no idea. I'm just letting you see that on a large platform, but it's every one of us. Um, my mother was diagnosed with a grade three, very large, aggressive astrocytoma. Um, she would go forward with four different rounds of invasive brain surgery, followed by a combination of chemotherapy and radiation, and this went on for 11 years. Um, at the same time, after two rounds of brain surgeries and radiation. My mother had my little sister when I was 19 years old. So yes, we are about 20 years apart, Charlotte Evangeline. And I opened that up. I let that audience know, hey, <laughs> I'm struggling. I am not just going to present a product. I am a person and these are the real struggles that I'm facing. And it just made it grow even more because they felt like it didn't have to be shiny. This, this thing that they saw as success, these viral cookies that keep selling out and everybody wants them, it was bigger than that. It was, she's a whole person who feels like me. And the reflection of people wanting to start their own small businesses, start their own side hustles, was so important to be reflected. I, it wasn't just me they were seeing anymore, but more so what they could see of themselves in me. And I knew that and I acted accordingly. So in the next two years, a lot happened rapidly. Obviously, the world doesn't stop, even when things get hard, even when you have a brand new baby, even when you become your sister's temporary, eventually permanent guardian, even when you have to help your mom every single day, get to those appointments and clean her up and fix her stitches after she's been stapled across the head yet again. It doesn't stop, so we had to take advantage of everything as quickly as we could, and that's what we did. Um, right out the gate in the next year or so, that, that selling out continued to happen, but it was not good. You would think that's the version of success, continuously selling out, but the pressure was immense. We started hiring as fast and as quickly as we could. Um, I was finally approached for a cookbook deal, which, again, how are you going to do it all? You just do, and you don't sleep, and you just do. Um, we also were approached for our first celebrity orders. So Jessica Simpson, Lance Bass, um, that again puts you on a completely different platform which makes the cookies sell even faster. So you're constantly catching your tail. But it was the most exciting thing I'd ever experienced in my life. The, how rapidly it was happening, the, the places I was invited to, and all of that happening despite being fired, despite being told that I wasn't good enough or I didn't belong at that table or I was a problem because obviously a woman can't show up to her job and do a good job when she's pregnant. Well, look what I did when I was pregnant. Look what I did despite the fact that I was a liability. Um, our platform also continued to grow to more than two million followers, um, a group that went on to start calling themselves our cookie monsters. I know, it's cheesy, I know. <laughs> but obviously this was one of the most exciting fast-paced moments of my life. All the while, we never had a physical bakery. We were working out of a rented commercial kitchen, and that's it. I went from being a cookie seller in my house, and within 12 to 18 months, I was moving numbers that most bakeries don't see in a year, um, in the matter of a month. And that was an incredible responsibility, but we needed to harness it fast, so we did start planning to open our bakery here in Memphis. On top of that, I did continue to use my platform for what I felt like was correct. And boy, did that come with consequences. Um, there was a moment, probably one of my most viral, where I chose to speak about how differently my husband and I were treated in public. I don't know if you know a place called Restaurant Depot, but almost every restaurant, food purveyor, anybody recommends it. And they go to it, and that's where you get all your big ingredients. Pregnant or strapped, or, or my baby strapped to my chest, I was hauling hundreds and hundreds of pounds of flour and sugar and butter. No help, 
not a word from anybody. Nobody even looked at me twice. But every single time my husband did the same thing, because he's a good partner and he's also his father, um, when he did the exact same thing, I chose to speak about, why is he the hero? We're doing the exact same thing. Why are you the hero? Why is it constantly like they could not believe that they were looking at a man with a baby strapped to his chest doing the same thing I did every day? Well, this went on to become quite a press tour. Um, and not only did I speak on several national talk shows about it, but it became massive clickbait. And by the way, they don't have to ask you. They don't have to ask you what pictures they choose. They don't have to ask you if you want your title to be TikTok mom. Um, they don't have to ask you anything, right? Because you made it public, you made that choice. So what, girl? Um, wonderful, very flattering moment for me. Trust me, there are worse ones than what you're looking at today. Um, and there's a lesson here. There's a lesson here about, yes, I put it out there. Yes, I accepted the consequences. I'd already been through the hate but this reached numbers that I had never experienced before. Phone calls, when people released my phone number online and the hateful things that were being said to me, the things that they chose to say about my children, the things that they chose to say about my dying mother, and all of that, consequences of what? Saying the truth? Saying that he shouldn't be treated as a hero because we're doing the same thing? Google reviews sinking to one star on my business all these stories coming out about what a horrible woman I was, their experience walking into my bakery that I didn't have, a bakery I did not have open, completely falsified. And I didn't take it down. I didn't remove the video because the most important thing was that 90%, that 90% of my comment sections being women going, that's what I say every day. Every time my husband brings home fast food, he's the fun dad. Every time I bring home fast food, I'm a lazy mom. Every time my husband takes the kids out of school and gets them a cupcake, he's a good dad, he's a fun dad. Every time I do that, I'm a bad mom. This constant flipped narrative, and that's what I chose to pay attention to, because it's a 90-10. If 10%, if, if 10 on the largest end of what you're looking at in your online response, because you're speaking out about something you really believe in, is negative, ignore it. If that 90% is speaking to people about things that matter to them, because finally you're saying what they've really thought in the back of their mind all this time, keep it up. Don't remove it. Don't, don't rethink what you've said and what you've thought and what you believe. Keep talking, but you're gonna have to accept that 10% and it's going to be really ugly. I'm sorry, it is. <laughs> My mother's passing. So along all of this time that I have made a name for myself, constantly been going viral. Yes, it's all very exciting, but I also kept it extremely, extremely honest about how difficult it is to be balancing that and caring for somebody who is actively dying of brain cancer. How difficult it is to have to turn around and tell your little sister that your mom has finally passed. 11 years my mom fought that battle and she didn't lose it. There is no losing when it comes to cancer. But I chose to keep that door open because if there's one thing that's true, a sacrifice you're going to have to make, or at least I had to make early on, is that I didn't get to take a day off. And I hated that. But I was at the beginning of what was finally becoming what I felt was my purpose. So I told the internet, and not only did it turn into a moment where I found more support than I ever would have found if I just shut myself in my room and continued to grieve and just fall down a dark hole, um, instead, what I found was the internet as a whole becoming so incredibly supportive. Yes, it can be a very, very ugly, volatile place, but please don't ever forget that it's the place that saved someone like me, that it's the place that put me in touch with resources that I never would have had, like free bereavement counseling. And it actively changed the way that I grieved, to feel like there were people watching me and going, oh, she's not the only one who feels like the world is ending, but still has to work because they don't have a choice. She still has to get up and be a mom because she doesn't have a choice. She still has to keep chasing that dream because she doesn't have a choice, and I didn't. But I don't regret opening up my doors and my journey, no matter what sides of it were online, because again, I chose to not just be a person and not just be a business, but to be all of it. Finally, the moment that we'd been waiting for forever. We opened our doors February of 2023, 
And when I tell you we were flooded, I mean packed to the gills. The entire day that we were open, mind you, we only got to stay open on our first day for six hours because they sold us out. But wall to wall, people who I was able to meet in my own community, because it's one thing to talk to your phone, it's one thing to read the comments, it's another thing to actively have people all day long for hours talk to you and go, I don't think you understand what a difference you talking about your grief meant to me. I don't think you understand what a difference it made to watch you be so scared and go after something and then be a success. So I started my own small business that I was kind of putting on the side. And the story after story that came out about watching me be a woman and a mother and a person and a business owner, that was the first day I ever actually felt like this is real. This is real. It's not just comments online. These are real people in my city and I am actively making a difference. And it's a terrifying feeling <laughs> to actually feel perceived in person. But it was probably one of the best days of my life. As we said, um, Activism has been a huge part of not only who I am as a person, but who we want to be as a company now. I now have a team of upwards of 10 wonderful, incredible women working for us at Bluff Cakes. And we utilize that with our recent ice storm. I don't know if anybody, if you remember having your kids home all week or not being able to drive or the snow plows or anything like that. But throughout that, we created a viral moment online that was called Cake It Forward. And our goal was 10,000 cupcakes. And so sad, we only donated 7,300 cupcakes to frontline workers here in Memphis. And not because we donated them out of our pocket, but because people online, not here in Memphis, but from all over the world donated. And we did frontline workers, we gave frontline workers in hospitals, the people who salt our roads, the bus drivers who were gonna be out of work, the, um, the wonderful people at the hub, running the shelters, providing warming centers, police officers, fire stations, and yes, in that bottom right corner, my old team at News Channel 3. Because it sucks to be a journalist in, <laughs> in, in bad weather, trust me. Um, and this incredible moment finally happened yet again where I got to use my platform for good. It's one thing to be somebody with a large audience online. It's one thing to be somebody who is considered popular online, but what you do with that matters so much more. What you do for your city with that, representing your city with that means so much more. And it means the world to me to be able to say that not only do I make sure at the top of anything anybody ever wants to know about me, that I am from Memphis and I am dedicated to Memphis, but turning around any, any little amount of influence I might have into the good that I can do for this city. So at the end of the day, what is the next phase of Bluff Cakes? Uh, three years ago, I was pregnant and in my house and making these weird, way too large cookies. And now we ship to all 50 states every two days, all across Canada. We have also branched into doing corporate gifting for some incredibly, incredibly large companies. Um, to be trusted with that is a huge honor, not only here in Memphis, but nationally. Um, we've launched into doing freeze-dried goods. That is my husband's prep project. Don't talk to me about that. And beginning what is probably the most exciting year of my life this year, which is several different collaborations with very, very large companies. We kicked our year off with our collaboration with the Girl Scouts, which is such an incredible full circle moment for me because not only was I a Girl Scout, my mother was my Girl Scout leader, but I love this organization to death. And this has been probably my favorite thing I've ever done. And just as final thoughts, I don't get up every day and think that I inspire anybody. It's honestly not even my goal. I just want to get through the day. I just want to get my kids on the bus. I just want to make it one more day as a small business owner. And I can't say that I have loftier goals than what I have right now because I do feel like I got what I wanted. I do feel like I've arrived, but I am competitive, so I'm not done. Um, but the amount of responsibility that has come with being on a really large social platform and being able to represent my city does not fly past me. I take it very, very seriously. The messages that I get on a daily basis that tell me, hey, I'm raising my two little brothers and I have no idea where to start. I own my own business. I don't know how you do it. The people who tell me, you know, I'm about to lose my mother. I'm about to lose my brother. I don't know how you do it. And the amount of responsibility that's been given to me to be able to go, I don't know either, 
but I just got up every day and started doing it, and I know you can too. The amount of responsibility that's given to me to just go, I'm just a girl, and I, I did no better than you. I don't know how I ended up where I am, but I'm grateful to be here. It's an incredible, incredible honor, and I can honestly say I've never been happier. Thank you. I'll start with one. I'll tell one story that Carol, you all reminded me of, but uh, Carol's story reminded me of my, mo my mother and in fourth grade, and I've told this story before, so if somebody's heard it, I apologize. Uh, in fourth grade, she goes to parent-teacher conference and she comes back and tells me the story. She had to take off from work as a secretary and the fourth grade teacher said, oh, Eric's doing great, he's a really good kid, he's doing fine. He's not like a lot of those kids with single moms. And my mom leaned forward and said, Mr. Thompson, I am a single mom. And I remember her telling me that, I was eight or something like that, and those stories stuck with me. And I would, hope, would have hoped, and my mother who passed away, would, who, as a president and a small business owner and, and many, many things, um, the, the story you have, the story I have from 45 years ago, would have, if not stopped, happened less frequently. And it doesn't. And it's, maybe it's less frequently, but it's too frequent, right? I mean, so, anyway. Um, I, I remember, I'm gonna start with Carol, I'll do a couple of questions. I remember when you took the job, a little bit after you took the job at, um, at River Parks, and there was a kind of off the record thing with the mayor, and it was an unveiling of the, of the beginning of the plan. And I remember you sit, getting there and saying, there have been, I think, 100 years of plans. And you had, a, you had all these maps and back in 1907 and 1920, making these dates up, you know, that there was a plan, there was a plan. And you said to this group of civic people, of wealthy people, of connected people, and me in the back, um, who, and you said, we're doing it this time. This time we're doing it. And it's an incredible accomplishment. And yet you have taken more heat, as much heat as I can think of in recent time public, public heat from people. So it's an amazing thing that you've done it, but it was also very much, and you and I have talked about this before, and I hope you don't mind me saying it, I mean, a lot of it was because you're a woman. It was a misogynistic tone, in the comments in, on the Daily Memphian, to my utter embarrassment. I was going to say, I've been making Eric rich, because <laughs> uh, I, I am the clickbait for Daily Memphian. Yeah. <laughs> But no, no, but I mean, you would see each other, you would call me, and I would always say to you, if you see something bad, and this is true of anyone, you know, if you see something bad in the Daily Memphian comments, please tell us. But it was misogynistic. It wasn't just that they didn't agree with the vision for the park. It was that how dare this woman change our park, right? Well, I, it was part of I, it. You know, it didn't occur to me for a long time that that's what was going on. Because honestly, I, I don't know about you, Chloe, and you tell. I, I feel, I felt your pain uh, as you described your experience online and the 10%, you know, will drive you crazy. Uh, but I, I didn't, I, I don't typically lead with, oh, I'm a woman and X. But it was funny even, even, think, uh, even thinking about women in business and what do I say? And I figured, you know, given the title of the seminar, it would be mostly women and thank you women, <laughs> uh, but, but I have to reflect on that, and I do believe there is uh, a lot of the vitriol, a lot of the vitriol was about change. It's just, we only know what we know, we only know what we see, and as one of my board members says, nostalgia is the most powerful hallucinogenic. <laughs> So, and I think in a city like Memphis, we are, we, we operate out of scarcity. You know, this sense of if I lose, if I lose something, I've lost it. Not that I may give something, something up to get something better. Mm -hmm. And that's really, and I think it's true about the music. I mean, it, it, there's this, I love the sense of heritage and history, but it sometimes holds us in place, in a place we do not need to be. And, uh, and, and I feel like that was most of what was going on, and I understand it, because people, in seven days when that park was activated, uh, that we, uh, Tomley Park, 
there were very powerful memories made, and that becomes nostalgic, and then you want to hold on to that. But, um, and, you know, like, well, who's she to tell us what to do? Or who's she to, you know, can she perform it? If we build it, we won't maintain it. Um, or somebody will kill, be killed there week one. Uh, or, oh, my God, black men playing basketball. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, you know it's true. You know, you're laughing because you know it's true. Um, I, um, I've taken much heat for that. Um, so, uh, but yes, do, I mean, when I read the comments, it is, um, have, this poor woman, uh, have any of you been doxxed online? Uh, it, it is, meaning, you know, they, somebody's published your address, it's funny, I was, when it, when it first happened to me, I happened, I live in downtown. When I open my door, uh, I am on the sidewalk on Union Avenue, right? And by the way, I walk back and forth by myself to FedEx Forum, back and forth, three, four times a week. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a twice subscriber. So I walk to the FedEx Forum a lot by myself. I am still here, see, all in one piece. No holes, no bullet holes, I'm fine. People don't understand that about downtown. But it did give me fear. I thought, well, is somebody out there waiting on me? And uh, so that's, that's a long answer. I was kind of stream of consciousness. But it, it's, it's, uh, it's a different kind of, it's a different risk to being public, to putting your to putting yourself out, you know, into controversy, and yet, you know, if you're going to do something important, there will not be consensus. I don't care how hard you work or how much engagement you do or, you know. We finally, just to say this, and Eric knows I've said this to him, social media magnifies a few voices. If you're persistent, and you get on and you say the same thing over and over. You had a non-existent uh, bakery, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, the non-existent bakery that your non-existent customer walked into and then gave you a one-star rating. I have a non-existent offshore bank account <laughs> that one of your commenters is very persistent about accusing me of having. I keep saying to my CFO, Art, find the damn account. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, misogyny. I, I do think, I do think the world is still tougher on women. A lot of heads nodding. You feel it too. I do. I mean, we can't let that stop us. Can't let it put us down. You know, slow us down. But it's there, and uh, I appreciate it when men recognize that and call it out among themselves. But I mean, listen, I'm going to explain it to you like a parent explains it, would explain it to a child. <laughs> All right. And next week, I'm turning 72. Excuse me. <laughs> you know. I, I kind of, I should have just gone to questions for the because I, we're a little behind here. But um, uh, questions. Anyone here? Oh, you all have questions. You know you do. I can't believe it. Yeah, in the back there, and speak, kind of speak up because the acoustics are weird, but thank you. Yeah. for standing up and telling us what you do and asking for advice. Good for you. I, I think that says, you know, you're on to good things. You, Chloe, you, oh, you Lord of mercy. <laughs> um, honestly, doing exactly what you're doing right now is the first step. Talking about it, talking about it all the time, exhausting the people that know you. 
one of the one of the most embarrassing things about starting, especially like online, is knowing that everybody you know is gonna pass it around to each other and be like, did you see that? Chloe started doing videos, that's so cringy. <laughs> knowing that, know it, know that that's happening, know that everybody who didn't like you in high school is gonna be talking about it and doesn't like it, and get over it really quickly. Get over that Oh no, they're quickly. gonna come to your book signing now. <laughs> They'll be there. <laughs> And then the next thing you know, they're going to be like, hey, girl, do you remember me? Oh, my God. Fuel that. Use it as fuel. Uh, but, no, just get over any portion of putting yourself out there being embarrassing very quickly. And keep doing that. Keep standing up. Put yourself online. Start, start doing the videos. If you don't like taking videos of yourself, get over that, too, because it's the next frontier. So start doing that quickly. You're doing great already. I would, first of all, I would... I want our youth development person, Bria Salisbury, who's here somewhere, I want y'all to meet. Um, that was my shameless plug. And I'm gonna make sure you meet before we leave here. Um, the second thing, she's just walking in the door right there, so y'all have gotta meet each other. <laughs> <laughs> she's used to me, she's used to me. Um, but the, the other thing that I would say is, is find your tribe, find your people. Find the people that are gonna support you and it is a, you know, it means going out, it means networking, it means all of that, but you will find people that have skills that, oh, I need that, I don't understand that. My friend so-and-so, they do marketing, they could probably explain this thing to me, or it, it's really is your circle that you put around you is your strength, and finding those people, that, that's what's always worked for me, um, and also finding some folks. There's, we have some children books authors in town. Alice Faye Duncan, amazing, you know, and a former librarian and loves to give advice. Um, she's somebody that would be a voice and is all about Memphis, all about helping young people, because you're younger than me and her. Um, and, you know, helping somebody else so it's easier for them. So, and I'm happy to connect y'all. Back, yeah, in the back room there. Yeah. Or back room. Ten years, and uh, four years ago, finally decided to take a leap and start my own business, and started on my uh, living benefits life insurance business. And I kind of hear uh, everyone's uh, here. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, woman entrepreneur, uh, we all have our star markets, right? Mm -hmm. We don't take no for an answer. Uh, I guess my question for you guys is. When do you find that band from her? Right? When is like, okay, anything, especially working in a professional male dominant world, right? You will keep asking, asking, right? When do you take a no as a no and where do you find that boundary? I've never heard no. <laughs> <laughs> never. It's never. It's like not right now. That's all they're saying because it's just not the right time. And just keep going back. And at a certain point, even that no will say, oh my goodness, this part, please. It's called delightful harassment. They'll say, they'll introduce you to somebody else just to get you off of them, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it's wor it works. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Listen, I think you're dealing with far more complicated issues than cookies. I feel less qualified to say anything, um, but I can say when it came to like opening a bakery, I don't know if you know this, those cost millions of dollars to open, and it doesn't matter how small they are, stuff's expensive these days. Um, so yeah, there were no's, there were no's that we faced, and there was, you know, well, let's see a little bit more of this, or I don't really understand your concept here, then they're not the right people, because they need to tell you what they need. And when we finally found the right team that was just like, oh, you're beyond ready for this. Not only is your, your sales through the roof, you know, you're doing this. It, it, it doesn't matter that you've never had a physical location. It doesn't matter if you've never had this or that. The right no or yes, the right no that we got was somebody who was like, no, but, no, but, no, but, just come back after you do X and Y. And I was like, finally, don't just say no. Say no and say something. And I think that was the right no for me, if that answers the question. I know, Carol is so quiet that Carol. it's just like, I I'm waiting. A <laughs> friend here, yeah. Hi, I'm Paula Spencer. I work at Alpha Bakery. I have a question for 
specifically for Carol. So building on that theme of the stubbornness and how that really powered you through a lot of those situations, especially the very negative comments that you had, how do you respond, internalize that, perhaps build off of that comment and then respond eloquently when you know that you're gonna be, particularly for somebody of color like me, who is Mexican, they'll be like, oh, the spicy Latina, that is so cute and fun. You'll be dismissed as being too aggressive or being like over the top when you really do care about what you're saying and you do feel anger for people putting you down. So how do you move forward with those feelings and then speak eloquently to let's move forward together to a solution? Yeah, well, well I wish I'd responded eloquently. Uh, <laughs> but, but to be honest, this, this is someone who, um, this was someone who is actually in the, uh, can uh, determine our, uh, can influence our funding. Um, and I decided that I would just let it go, not respond, and get back on track. I mean, I, I didn't. I did not think it was worth. And I, I think I'm a middle child. I mean, that's why. The, like sometimes the vitriol, like it's like I'm a middle child. I try to get along with everybody. What is wrong? Uh, so, and, and in that case, I really just let it go. In that conversation, uh, I don't know. Was that a bad thing? I. I, I it may have been. I mean, maybe I should have like confronted him to help him understand he might not want to do that again, uh, or say that to his female colleagues. But um, he did come back. I will tell you. Here's the end of the story. Uh, he did come back after you know three or four minutes. It clearly did uh, finally occur to him maybe he didn't say the right thing. And I'm going to pretend Eric said this, which of course he didn't. <laughs> But he said, you know, Carol, that may have sounded like mansplaining to you, but you know, that was just, uh, that, I, as I tell my colleagues, that was just air explaining mm -hmm. because I say that to everyone, not just the fairer sex. And I thought, <laughs> at this point, you are digging the hole deeper and you may want to quit now. Uh, but I mean, clearly he did, I didn't have to point it out to him. He recognized it, but <laughs> I, it like I worse. said, you know. Oh, it, it, oh it, men can get worse. I mean, <laughs> just, he said it. Trust me, my people are. <laughs> Uh, it, just to be clear, there that are, was not me. This was not a, like an no, elaborate joke no, where I no. said that. <laughs> I do say, we, are, we are really, uh, I know some people have had to leave and we've got drinks and I hate to cut this off, but y'all are going to be here. You can ask, you can talk to people. Um, I want to say one last funny thing. When you're talking about the 200 pound mixer, that's your mm -hmm. husband, I think, right there. Mm -hmm. Behind me was going 400. 400. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, I, I, I wouldn't know. I don't have I to pick it I just thought it was up. so funny that he was like, 400, 400. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, we've got drinks. You can ask uh, folks. You might let them get a drink, or we'll try to get you all a drink. Thank you all for being here. I'm sorry we didn't get to more Q&A, and thank you to the panelists. Uh, poor little... Uh...